encourage you to get a Bible and turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Those verses will be on the screen before you. There'll be some things in the context you'll want to see, so turn to Luke chapter 19 with me, if you will, as a beginning place for our study this morning. We're going to pick up, begin reading at verse 41. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city, that's the city of Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. While you have your Bible open, back up to about verse 28, and you'll see the setting is that this is on Sunday of Passion Week. We generally understand without giving all the evidence at this juncture that the entry, triumphal entry into Jerusalem took place on Sunday of Passion Week. And this is when this is taking place, according to verse 28, as he's making his way to Jerusalem. So this is on that Sunday of Passion Week as he's making his way into Jerusalem. Verse 37 says he's descending from the Mount of Olives, making his way toward Jerusalem. And as he makes his way from the Mount of Olives, comes from the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem, he sees a picture of Jerusalem from this angle. And as he looks at the city of Jerusalem, the text says he, he came near and he wept over it. Notice that at verse 41. As he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Verses 43 and 44 says that the day of destruction is coming for Jerusalem. That there's going to come a time in which an army will come and build an embankment around you on every stone, there will not be one stone left upon another. You'll be encircled and be destroyed, announcing the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's go back to that text and notice at verse 41, seeing that city, knowing what was ahead, the text says he wept over it. It's not the idea of a tear dropping down from his cheek, but Strong says it means he would wail aloud. Robertson said he burst into tears, probably audibly weeping. And so if you can get the picture as Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem and is he coming from the Mount of Olives, he looks down upon the city of Jerusalem and he begins to weep and cry aloud, wailing over that city. And the text says that he made this statement, if you had known... The point is, this could have been prevented. You could have prevented this. If you had known what? Two things that he mentions. If you had known the things that make for peace, and you had known the time of your visitation. If you had known these two things. If you would have known the things that would have brought peace to this city, to this nation, and would have spared the city. If you had embraced the Messiah, and had understood who he was, and accepted the Messiah, the things that make for you, peace, then, then this would have been spared. Secondly, if you'd known the time of your visitation, and I cite 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 12, where a similar phrase is used with reference to a time of judgment. It can be a time of mercy. It can be a time of punishment and destruction, the time of your visitation, when God will visit you. And in this case, it's talking about God visiting the city of Jerusalem with destruction. If you had known things that make for peace, and had you known the time of your destruction what you could have been but notice further in that same text he said even you if you had known even you that is even in all your sin even with all of your rebellion and even with all of your stubbornness if you had known even you even this rebellious nation what about this rebellious day? Especially in this your day. What is he talking about? Especially in the day that the Messiah has come. 
in the day that you had opportunity to see the Messiah and see the evidence of the Messiah and could have accepted Him and embraced Him and had put off this destruction and had, had been the kind of people that God would not have visited destruction. Even you, especially in this year day, even at this late day you could be salvaged if they would be. But now they're hidden from your eyes, the text says. If you had known, even you, he said, even you. But now they're hidden from your eyes. They have been blinded and they have ignored. The point is this tragedy could have been prevented, but they would not listen to God. They rejected the message of God. Bowles observes that their prejudice and their ignorance their unbelief had blinded their eyes to the truth. They're hidden from your eyes. You ignored it, you, you, you turned a blind eye, and you wouldn't pay any attention. So here's what I'm learning from this. They've gone too far and waited too long. And that's why Jesus looks upon the city of Jerusalem as he's coming down from the Mount of Olives, and he sees the city and he weeps audibly over it because he realizes they've gone too far and they've waited too long. Barnes says, but it's too late. The national wickedness is too great. The cup is full. Mercy is exhausted. And Jerusalem, with all of her pride and splendor, the glory of her temple, the pomp of her service, must perish. It's a shame and a tragedy because of what this city could have been. This was the center and the core of Judaism. And what a shame and tragedy when you realize what this nation and what this city could have been. Pulpit observes that the mighty memories which hung so thickly around the sacred city and the glorious house of God, after all, constituted its chief charm. What might not this city have been? What splendid and far-reaching work might it not have done? And now the cup of its iniquities is just brimming over. Only a few more short years in silence must be an awful brood over the shapeless ruins of what once Jerusalem and her house of Zion, the joy of the whole earth. What a shame that is. What I want to suggest to you, it is a sad thing. It is a tragedy, when, or what a, how sad it is when a tragedy could not be helped. When, when destruction comes and tragedy befalls a city, a nation, or whatever it may be, and it couldn't be helped, how tragic that is and how sad that is. But even sadder than that is when the tragedy could have been prevented and it was ignored. And that's what Jesus is saying here in our phrase. Go again to verse 42 of your text. If you had known, this could have been prevented. How often do you hear phrases like this? How often do we hear somebody say, you know, I just didn't know. I just didn't know what, what was, I, I didn't know the truth on that. I just didn't know. Or I wished I had known then what I know now. Or I wished I had heard that 20 years ago. Sad it is when you preach a lesson or present material on the home and the family and rearing children, having a great marriage. Somebody will come out and say, I wished I'd heard that 20 years ago. Too late now. If we had known. But I want to suggest to you that it's sadder still when it comes to your end and others say about you, if you had only known. If you hadn't ignored, if you'd just paid attention, if you'd just taken heed. So let's go back to our text in Luke chapter 19. And if you've turned from there, let's go back and let's open our Bibles. And if you're so disposed to underline, you might take this phrase at verse 42 that said, if you had known. How sad it would be at the end of our time that others stand around and they say concerning us when they realize our tragedy that has befallen us that they say if he had just known, if he had just known, if she had just known, if she had just known. Known what? Well, let's start with this. If you had known the urgency of correcting your life, you might not lose your soul. If you had understood and if you had just known the urgency of correcting your life. Let's look at some simple matters. We might even call them first principle matters. Let's turn to John 8 and in verse 21. And understand that sin will keep one out of heaven. That's the problem with sin. If, if sin didn't keep us out of heaven, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. 
It might be an embarrassment. We might be doing something that we don't want others to know, but, but no big problem if it didn't keep us out of heaven, but it will keep us out of heaven. Let's turn to John chapter 8 and in verse 21. Jesus said that if you die in sin, where I go, you cannot come. Where is he going? He's going to heaven. So Jesus said, if you die with sin in your life, where I go, which is heaven, you can't go with me. So here's what I'm learning from that, that sin will keep you out of heaven. So sin must be forgiven. In order for me to go to heaven and have the hope of eternal life, then I have to have that sin removed from my life. That is, the guilt of that sin removed from my life. So for one who is not a Christian and is becoming a child of God, they must obey the gospel for the remission of sins. So sins would be removed. That's why you become a Christian. That's why you're baptized is for the remission of sins. Once I become a child of God, like, like we have the case in uh, Simon in Acts chapter 8, he was told as an erring child of God to repent therefore of this thy wickedness, if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. He needed to be forgiven. Why? Because sin will keep you out of heaven. But let's go further. Now, what's the urgency of correcting my life? What's the urgency of becoming a Christian so that sin is taken away? And what's the urgency if I have sin in my life as a child of God that I need to do something to get rid of that sin? What's the urgency of that? Here's something quite simple. It's because I could die. Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 27, it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. When will that take place in your life? You don't know. None of us know that. So it's because I could die and then I lose the opportunity to correct my life. Or here's something else that could happen. It could be that Christ would return. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, No one knows the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man will return. Not even the angels of heaven know that. Nor the Son, Mark's account said, but the Father only. Since no one knows when Christ will return, then if you're beginning to guess at that, then you're just, you're just barking up the wrong tree because you don't have a clue when he's going to return. None of us do. So Christ could return at any moment, or it could be a long time from now. Since I don't know when, that's the urgency of correcting my life before God. But here's another problem, and that is my heart could become hardened in sin. Today, if you will hear his voice, a quotation from Psalm 95. Today, if you will hear his voice. Heed the voice today, lest if you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, the danger is that if I put off my correction of sin, I could become so hardened in sin that I'd make no changes and don't want to make any changes in my life. But I want to suggest to you that there are too many who are careless and they delay that decision. You see, they think they have plenty of time. Uh, they, I'm going to. They're making plans that someday I will. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to turn things around in my life. I, I'm thinking about it seriously, but I've got plenty of time. I'm young. I'm in good health. I think things are going to go well. They don't really think Christ is going to return immediately. And we live as if there's no dangers of dying. I'm, I'm going to live forever. There's no danger that anything could happen to me. And so I'm going to get around to, to making changes in my life. And we live as if we don't think Christ could return in our own lifetime. In somebody's lifetime, he's coming back. That could be mine. It could be yours. And so we live as if we don't think he's coming back, perhaps. How sad it would be when time is all over. And others know that you had not made correction in your life. And they stand around and they weep and they say, if you'd only known. If you'd only known. If you had known, even you, if you had known what tragedy could have been prevented. But here's the second thing. If you had only known the difference it makes in baptism, what does the Bible say about baptism? Well, the Bible says baptism is important. Let's see why it's important. Well, it's in order to be saved. Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus said baptism was in order to be saved. That's why it's important. Well, let's go to another passage, Acts 2 and in verse 3. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So baptism is important because it's in order to obtain the remission or the removal of sins. It is important because it is to get into Christ. 
we're baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 27. So baptism is very important. But I want to suggest to you that there are many who think that baptism is baptism. I know it's important. But you see, baptism is baptism, and I have been baptized. And so if baptism is essential, I don't think it is, someone may say. But even if it is, I've been baptized, so I'm okay. Because after all, baptism is baptism. And so they may have been baptized as an infant. But if baptism is important, I've been baptized, I'm okay. Or maybe they were baptized into a denomination a number of years back. And so I was baptized be, before when I went to this denomination over here, and they baptized me over there, and I was baptized into that denomination. But if baptism is important, and baptism is baptism, and I'm okay because I've been baptized, you see. And you see, baptized at the time, someone may say, is an outward sign of an inward grace. You say, what does that mean? What that means, if you were baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace, you were baptized as a manifestation, you were already saved. That's what that means. So that's the reason I was baptized, but baptism is baptism. I think I'll be all right with reference to that. Let's go to the Acts 19, the 19th chapter and notice that baptism can be wrong. In other words, baptism is not baptism. Here were some people who had been baptized under the baptism of John, which, by the way, was for the remission of sins. They'd only been baptized with John's baptism. And when they were asked about the question of the Holy Spirit, they didn't know so much if there were a Holy Spirit, the text says. And when they were taught, they were baptized again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now why'd they have to be baptized again, even though they had been baptized under John's baptism? Because John's baptism never put one into the kingdom, and the baptism under the Great Commission did put one into the kingdom. There's the difference. Baptism wasn't baptism, then was it? So I need to make sure that my baptism is not wrong, but it's right. In other words, my baptism needs to have the right person being baptized. When someone baptizes an infant, or you were baptized as an infant, you were not baptized as the right person because it is believers that are be, to be baptized. Many of the Corinthians, Acts 18, 8, hearing believed and were baptized. Those who were baptized believed. As an infant, you can't believe. So if you were baptized as an infant, you were baptized as the wrong person. You see, it could be the wrong reason you're baptized. If you were baptized because you are saved, as an outward sign of an inward grace, then you're the wrong person because the one who is to be baptized is one who is being baptized in order to be saved, Mark 16, 16. It's the wrong person. You see, if you were baptized by the wrong authority, it's the wrong baptism. What do you mean a wrong authority? Some are baptized by the vote of the church. You go to the church and you tell them, I want to be baptized, and you have to tell your account of being saved and how you were saved. You say, well, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and had this feeling come over me and, and I just felt overwhelmed and I feel, like, I feel like I'm saved. And if they are convinced you are, the church votes on it, and if we have enough votes, they will baptize you by the authority of the church. They have to vote on you to do that. It's a very common practice right here in, this, in our very city. And yet the authority of the New Testament was the authority of Christ. They're baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins by the authority of Christ. It wasn't the vote of the church. So if you're baptized by the vote of the church, it's the wrong baptism. Here is the wrong action. When someone said, well, I was baptized, you see, I was sprinkled, and so I was baptized. See, that's the wrong action. Because in the New Testament, baptism was a burial. You're buried with him in baptism, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And I want to suggest to you that it would be sad in the end of time or when your life is over. And those who know you stand around and they realize you were baptized as the wrong person or the wrong reason or for the, by the wrong authority or by the wrong action. How sad it would be when you'd been told the truth that they say about you if you'd only known if he had only known about his baptism. If she had only known about her baptism. But the baptism wasn't according to the New Testament. If they had only known how sad that would be. But here's another thing I want us to consider. What about the dangers of worldly friends? Do we know about the danger of worldly friends? Let's open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs, if you will, and go to chapter 12. The Proverbs are abundant with warnings 
that are very practical about friends and the dangers of who we associate with. And the warning here is that friends should be chosen carefully. If friends are important to you, and they are to each of us, then our friends should be chosen carefully. What an insult it is to your friends if you say that, you know, you don't have to be careful in choosing friends. Anybody will do as a friend. That's kind of an insult to those who are your friends, isn't it? But here's a passage that says, friends should be chosen carefully. Let's look at at chapter 12 and verse 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. What does it mean carefully? He realizes, the righteous man realizes, this person here would be a good friend and helpful to me. This one here is not a good friend, and that one is a pretty good friend, but I think this one over here is a better friend because of what they will do for me. Now, the contrast is the way of the wicked leads them astray. Why do you choose your friends carefully? Because of the danger, notice the contrast of being led astray. Here's what I'm learning. I'm learning friends should be carefully chosen. Now, why is that? Because friends can corrupt our morals, not just change my outlook on life, not just kind of change my perspective about something, but they can even influence my morals. Evil communication corrupts good morals. Now that's concerning false teachers in 1 Corinthians 15. That if you spend some time around false teachers, they may not even be your intimate friend, but you spend some time with them, they corrupt your, your, your morality. How much more so someone who is a close intimate friend would have that impact on your morality. Evil communications corrupts good morals, the text says. You see, friends can change us to be just like they are. Let's go to the 22nd division of the book of Proverbs. I said Proverbs is full of these kind of things. So let's go to the 22nd division and in verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man do not go. Now why do I not want to have a close relationship and a best friend relationship, spend a lot of time around an angry person? I'm not angry. I don't don't fly off the handle. I don't lash out at people in anger, but my friend does. What's the danger of that? Notice now, read with me at verse 25. Lest you learn his ways, and he set a snare for your soul. In other words, there's the danger, as we saw earlier in Proverbs 12, 26, to become just like they are. But I want to suggest to you quite often the warnings are ignored. We can warn about that. Parents can go to their children and say, look, I don't really like the kind of people you're hanging out with and I think they will be a bad influence on you and the child pushes back. And the preacher warns about that and the child pushes back and maybe the elders talk to them and they push back and friends talk to them. Uh, Other friends who are Christians talk to them and they push back and they ignore the warnings. And maybe they say things like this. You know what? I have a good influence on them. I may convert them instead of them leading me astray. Or I'm strong, you see, and I know what's right. They're not going to tell me what's wrong. And I want to suggest to you that there have been many Christians who've gone astray that when you begin to inquire, what happened to them? What happened? Where where did they go wrong? And the answer is found in two words, Wrong crowd. That's what happened. Many marry non-Christians. They grow weaker and ultimately become unfaithful. How sad it would be when you come to the end of your road and your friends are standing around and they say concerning you as they weep audibly, if you'd only know, if you'd only know the danger of friends. Tried to warn them they didn't listen, they didn't pay attention, if they'd only known, if they'd only known. But here's another matter. What about the missed opportunities to grow if we'd only known? You see, God expects us to grow. In Colossians chapter 1, let's go, go to Colossians chapter 1. Paul's prayer for the Colossians was he hoped they would grow. Not just for growth's sake, but they're under the threat of the Colossian heresy, whatever that involved. There's a 
not a question about what all the elements were in the Colossian heresy. There are a number of things that were going on. But whatever's involved in this Colossian heresy, they were under the threat of that, and Paul wants them to grow. Look at verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He doesn't just want them to have knowledge. Look at verse 10. That you might have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. But I don't want just that. I want this, verse, verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Paul said, I want you to grow. I want you to grow. You see, we need to be diligent in Christian graces, add faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. But that's bookended by two statements giving all diligence and be even more diligent. Give it the best shot you have. Put everything you have into that is the idea. Now that's probably the desire of every person present. If we were so disposed to take a poll and ask for a show of hands, who wants to grow spiritually? Probably every hand would go up. Now, how many do not want to grow and you want to diminish spiritually? I don't think I'd see a hand at all. That's the desire of all. In other words, we don't really want to be weak. In fact, we look at faith and strength and are in, even envious of that and say, you know what, I'd like to have that kind of faith and that kind of strength that brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so have. I wish I had that. But I want to suggest to you there are multiple opportunities that are missed all of the time. 